Fargo School Board to order. Before we get started on the agenda, I will note that we do have a fairly lengthy agenda, and so if we do run short on time, we may forward um, the NDSB or NSBA reports to the next meeting upon the wishes of the board. David will be joining us most likely a little bit later, and Rebecca is having some car issues, so she might might come in soon. So with that, um, I would entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. Paul? I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Okay, there's Second. also. I'd like to make an amendment to that, to add an HR please. addendum. I'd like to amend that to include the HR addendum. Okay. Oh, okay. We can make that as a friendly amendment, Claudia. Yeah. Very friendly. Very friendly. I accept that. Okay. All those in favor of proceeding with the agenda as presented with the addition of the um, HR addendum, please vote by saying yes. 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 Any opposed? No. We have an agenda. The strategic plan in action. Who would like to make the introductions? Rachel. Thank you. Tonight we have a group from Lewis and Clark here um, with Mr. Cressup, their principal, and Stacy Anderson, who is Gifted Services, and they are reporting on Result 5 Citizenship and sharing about the Buddy Bench initiative that they have going on at Lewis and Clark this year. Anderson, I'm the gifted and talented teacher at Lewis and Clark, and I'm really pleased to have a representation of the Buddy Bench Ambassadors. These are fifth grade students who agreed at the beginning of the year to take on a service learning project. Um, service learning is a great opportunity for kids to um, do a variety of school um, agendas, but also helping their community at the same time. So I'm going to let them do the presentation and most of the talking. We're going to let this be our buddy bench because we do model um, the buddy bench expectations. So I'm going to just pull that out and I'll let them introduce themselves as they go through the presentation. Hi, my name is Jocelyn, and I am one of the Buddy Bench Ambassadors at Lewis and Clark. We are here to tell you about the Buddy Bench and how people use it, oh, and how to make buddies with this bench. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Hi, my name is Emma, and I'm also one of the Buddy Bench Ambassadors. I'm going to tell you about Christian's story. The founder of the Buddy Bench is Christian Bucks. He was a second grader at Roundtown Elementary in Pennsylvania when he came up with the idea. He saw a problem in his school. People were being left out on the playground. So he did some research and discovered a buddy bench in Germany and came up with the idea to have a colorful bench for students who were lonely at recess to help them find friends at his school. He taught his friends at school that if someone is sitting on the buddy bench, that other students need to go out of the way to befriend that student. And I think you should know that when we presented this at, Lew at the Lewis and Clark Assembly, we actually got a Skype with Christian and asked him some questions. Hi. Er, hi, my name is Elsa. I'm a Buddy Bench ambassador. And I'm here to tell you what a Buddy Bench is. A Buddy Bench is a bench that you can, that you can go to if you need a buddy. The Buddy Bench is really easy to use. All you have to do is sit on the bench and wait for someone to befriend you. You can help make the buddy bench successful by being, by being will, willing to befriend someone who is sitting on the bench and let them play with you and your friends. We have one re red-lettered bench for K-2 through two students and one blue-lettered bench for 3-5 through five students, grade students on, out on our playground. Hi, my name is Nevea, and I'm going to tell you how to model the buddy bench procedure. I mean, I'm going to show you them modeling the buddy bench procedures. The four reasons to sit down on the buddy bench are, first, if you're new to school and you don't have many friends. Second, if you want to make some new friends. Third, 
weird if your friends aren't at school that day. And fourth, if you want to play a different game than your friend does that day. It's an easy solution to a big problem. Hi, my name is Olivia, and I am also a Buddy Bench ambassador. I am going to tell you Skylar's story and his mom's donation. Back in 1990, Skylar Jones went to Lewis and Clark as a student. His best friend Jason from Lewis and Clark loved his big heart and his extremely kind personality. He grew up to be a man who cared deeply about the environment and recycling. He would light up any room with his smile and generous spirit. Skylar had asthma, and sadly on August 2nd, this last summer, he passed away after suffering a severe bronchial asthma attack. After reading our article in the kids' section in the newspaper, Skylar's mom, Beth Jones, contacted the school about helping us with our service learning project. She had been researching recycled buddy benches and wanted to donate two recycled buddy benches in his memory. Thanks to Skylar and his mom, Lewis and Clark will be able to promote and use the buddy bench for years to come. Hi, my name is Kevlin, and I'm also a Buddy Bench Ambassador, and this is a picture of Skylar Jones. And while we were at the school presenting this, his mom actually came and was there, and we put um, a plaque there for him. As a team um, in the GT program, and then they still currently endorse the Buddy Bench pretty much on a weekly basis because we keep getting new students. So every time a new student arrives at Lewis and Clark, Buddy Bench's uh, ambassadors go out in teams of two. They greet that student, they welcome them to Lewis and Clark, they tell them about the Buddy Bench program. Um, they made flyers that are on all the classroom doors and then they take the child out and show them the Buddy Bench and model how to use it. So it's definitely been getting a lot of use. We had to do one public service announcement so coats don't get on it when the weather got nice. Um, <laughs> but I'm very proud of the work that they've done and the leadership and the teamwork that these students have done for Lewis and Clark and all of their peers. So if we could give them a round of applause and thank them for coming. Thank you, that was wonderful. Do we have any questions for our students from Lewis and Clark? Any questions? That was really cool, guys. Board members, any questions? Would, we're, we're starting to kind of have a tra tradition here. Would you guys mind, having, uh, excuse me, coming up and getting a picture with the school board? Would that be okay? Even you FYC kids that I know. Come on up, Kevlin. Okay. Next item is recognition of the audience, and we did not have any audience members address, signed up to address the board, but I don't want to presume that everybody knows our operating rules, so does anybody wish to address the board at this time? Okay. See no hands. Our next item on the agenda is staff reports, and we have, are you, an FEA report. 
Go ahead and introduce yourself for everybody, please. Okay. This is a little anticlimactic. I'm Laura Haugen Christensen. I teach English language arts at Davies High School. And tiny little report, David Marquardt has a softball game in West Fargo tonight. I invited him to come sit in the hall with me during executive session. He declined. Um, coming up this weekend, the NDU, North Dakota United Delegate Assembly, is in Bismarck, and we have about a dozen people representing from FEA. Um, last week, um, two weeks, fewer than two weeks ago, we had a bargaining conference also in Bismarck, um, and we had mm, a different dozen people attending that one. And that's our report. Thank you, Laura. Mr. Leitz, legislative update. Madam President, members of the board, uh, as you're likely aware and, and reading in the paper recently, um, the legislature currently is about all the budgets uh, statewide and really uh, working through balancing the budgets and, and taking a look at those. Uh, I'm certain there's some other bills that are still being worked on, but, but as typical with most sessions, um, the heavy lifting on all the funding bills gets done in the last two to three weeks. Um, as you may be aware, and we shared uh, with planning, uh, the K-12 funding bill, Senate Bill 2031, uh, had some significant changes from in the House uh, from what was originally introduced in the Senate, and we're currently uh, working with the conference committee to uh, talk about uh, what we'd like to see as priorities uh, in, in uh, putting that bill together. I will be sending out to you sometime tomorrow the one-page talking list that we've typically done uh, for you to have as information as far as what we would be looking for. Uh, briefly, I will just tell you that our emphasis will really be on three areas in that bill. Uh, we really will want to encourage um, both, uh, not only the conference committee, but both House and Senate members to uh, do what they can in regards to the base formula, the base uh, foundation aid formula, uh, as far as increasing that, that decreased from originally introduced just over 3% down to 2%, and so we'd like them to do uh, whatever work they could to replenish portions of that. Our second uh, area of emphasis will be on the uh, at-risk uh, weighting factor uh, in the Senate version. There was a significant increase in the at-risk factor for uh, K through 3 students, and that was put back to the base uh, that it had been in previous years in the House version, and we would encourage them to really take a look at that and try to restore that closer to uh, the Senate version for a weighting factor. And then our third emphasis uh, will be on uh, funding for ELL, uh, both a combination of the weighting factors that the Senate had for ELL, which again, everything was put back to uh, what it had been prior in the House version, and then also the ELL uh, grant program. So those will be the three points of emphasis, and I think it's very important for us as a district to really try to narrow our focus. Um, there's a lot of work to do in that bill, uh, and there's a lot of areas that, uh, as originally introduced, um, needed to be looked at, and I think we need to give the conference committee um, a, a narrower focus, and so I think it's important for us to stay on point with those talking points, and I'll get those out to you uh, as we move forward. And Brock again, budget assumptions. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, uh, the planning committee uh, met recently and, and we talked very briefly about budget uh, assumptions. We are hard at work at creating the budget. We really have spent most of our time on the expense side of the budget currently as uh, Jackie Gap and Joy Redrath and their teams are working with departments as we're trying to create uh, budgets. As you know, philosophically, uh, we've shifted and tried to create budgets from the grassroots level and have each department build that. So lots of work on the expense side. And until we get the funding formula uh, resolved, the K-12 bill, um, the revenue side is really up in the air. And so uh, I hope by the 28th of April, our second meeting, that we will likely have something for us to report on as far as K-12 funding, and then we can really ramp up the revenue side of the budget as well. Um, if we meet again in planning, we'd take it there first. If not, we certainly would bring you an update, uh, hopefully on the 28th. Thank you, Brock. Anything else from, from you while you're at the floor? Nothing else at this time. Okay. 
Who would like to make the next introductions, the advantage? Uh, Rachel again. again. Yes. Um, tonight we have uh, Lori Barlow, who is our district math facilitator for our elementary schools, um, and Jennifer Schulteis, who is currently our principal at Eagles and will be transitioning, as you know, to EdClap next year. And this is an extra report that these two actually contacted me and volunteered for. A um, lot of excitement about what they have going on over at at Eagles this year. However, Lori works with all of the elementary buildings with her primary focus on the Title I. Uh, if you recall last year, we had a presentation about reading recovery, servicing our primary students in literacy. Advantage Math Recovery, also known as AVMR, is the math somewhat version of that. And they are here to share some background information as well as some successes that they're finding with this program. So I will turn it over to Mrs. Schulteis. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, tonight, we really want to uh, share some things with you about what's the buzz with all of the math that's happening in the elementary schools. Um, these are just some of the comments that you may have heard, especially if you are a Facebook user. Uh, some of those comments about what's all this new math? What's this common core math? Um, how can it possibly take a whole page to do a subtraction problem if they only learned it the way that I did? So tonight, we want to shed a little bit of light on some of the things that are happening because because it is true that math instruction looks a little bit different than the way most of us were taught. Uh, so we want to kind of explain uh, why we think that's a good thing. And it's actually not because of the Common Core Standards. Uh, this is just our fourth and fifth grade, um, a statement from the North Dakota State Standards. And as you can see, the standards actually specify that students do, in fact, learn to add, subtract, multiply, and divide using the standard algorithm. And that would actually be the one that most of us were taught. And it's the one that most of us use when we're not using a calculator. Uh, but the nice thing is that the standards also recognize that students need a strong foundation. So this is just an excerpt, for example, from a second grade. And what the standards do for us is that at least two years prior to learning the traditional standard algorithm, there's some very clear standards about how we need to explicitly help students create a foundation. Because what happens is our standard algorithms or standard methods of solving problems, they're actually shortcuts. And shortcuts make a lot more sense once that solid foundation is there. Research tells us that if we show students the shortcuts before they have a solid foundation, the ability for them to continue to build their understanding of that concept, it we're shutting it down. So it's really important that we use that time to build a strong foundation because then students, they understand the foundation plus they understand the shortcut. So now they're not just students who can get the answer to a problem, but they're students who can use math, which we know is extremely essential to 21st century skills. So there are actually some new things, but it's not the math that's new. Uh, the way that we are teaching math is we ensure that it's research-based, it's data-driven, um, it's about developing that deep understanding and building conceptual knowledge for students, creating students who can use math and not just do the math, most importantly, and what you're going to really hear about tonight, is that it's about highly trained teachers. It's not about a specific program. It's not about a specific curriculum. It's about ongoing high quality professional development for teachers who truly understand uh, this developmental foundation that the students need, again, in order to become those mathematical problem solvers and to support, to support the 21st century skills. So this is a little bit about why the math is changing. Uh, now, Lori Barlow is going to help us understand how we are going um, about meeting these lofty goals that we have. Hello, as Jennifer said, the math is really the math that we have all done, but we are building that foundation of understanding. The problem that is on the screen right now is a typical problem that students would be faced with. As teachers and uh, as adults who have gone through school systems in the past, 
this is perhaps the way that the problem has, would be solved in most minds. That's what we're familiar with. Much of what we see in the news is looking at a very different way of students solving it, and oftentimes those depictions are pages long or a, a full page, but truly it is about that understanding and how quickly we can think about number sense that, you know, we're 100 away from 298 and then four more, it's 104. That is much faster. And that reflects the mental math that we're really supporting with our students, those solutions that they can use when they're out and about in the world in which we live, that they're making those um, quick mental calculations so that they aren't crippled by having to have a device with them. As Jennifer said, it really is about professional development for teachers. The most important um, indicator for how students will do is that professional in the room that feels empowered and knowledgeable to make decisions, the millions of decisions that they make every day from a knowledge standpoint. Advantage Math Recovery is a professional development program. In that program, teachers learn assessments that they can use. The assessments are given one-on-one -on -one to students. Then they take that assessment data and they use that to drive their instruction. That instruction is sometimes from the core program, our everyday math program, and they are informed to make decisions from that. And sometimes it's small group instruction that really is activity-based that comes from a pool of activities that come through AVMR. The learning framework in number that you see on the top left of the screen is the mathematical progression for um, early numeracy instruction, and that is an AVMR framework. What you see overlaid on the bottom right comes from the Common Core State Standards, and that is what I like to call the road to algebra. Those two are so closely linked that the, the work of building understanding with students that happens in AVMR training is what is going to help our students to succeed in algebra, and we know that that's been one of the key indicators that our students have been struggling with. The program also um, enables teachers to deal with students, differentiate for through MTSS, to look at their whole class data and to make those decisions within the program. Teachers sit one-on-one -on -one with students when they're assessing and really are in tune to what the students are doing and their strategies. The kids enjoy the assessments. They don't see them as drudgery. Um, oftentimes, they don't even know they're being assessed. Sarah and Laura are going to share some teacher perspectives now. So we have Sarah come up. Hi, I'm Sarah George, and I teach third grade at Eagles Elementary. Um, AVMR, it gives me an academic starting point for each one of my students. When there are grade level standards that students have to master, it can be very difficult for them, but especially when the math foundation is not there. AVMR breaks down these concepts and skills to make standards attainable. AVMR has helped me understand the math concepts that my students already know, so I know what to build on from there. Um, this is a research-based program that I feel has helped me identify gaps and close gaps for my students. I realize how important the math foundational skills are for all students. Um, I recently taught in Houston, Texas, and I, you know, would have parent-teacher conferences, and the parents would come in, and we'd be talking, and I would say, you know, they're just not quite there. They haven't met that standard yet. And then I would talk about, you know, there's some gaps, and we need to close those gaps. And then I would say, okay, this is how we're going to close those gaps, and I would try to put a plan in place. And let's fast forward. I come to Fargo. I start teaching in Fargo, and... AVMR is presented and I start implementing AVMR into my classroom and this year parents come in for student teacher conferences and we talk about those gaps and how those gaps need to be closed and I'm confident now in saying I know how to close those gaps I you know this is what we do in the classroom these are tools that you can do at home and it's a research based program and it gives me that confidence in you know as a teacher of knowing that I am doing exactly what I need to do to make sure that the students are making those gains. Um, I feel that all kids are getting pushed in the, well, I don't feel it, they are. All kids are being pushed in this program. Even the higher level students are being pushed. 
And the students absolutely love it. They get so excited for AVMR each day. Um, I see the excitement in their face. They ask, you know, when do we get to do AVMR? So it really excites them. And the reason for this is because, well, I think that they love it, or I lo they love it so much because I feel that every child is at their level and they're finding success within their range. It's that moment in the day where I meet them exactly where they're at. They can come back to the ta table and feel confident in knowing that we're gonna do things right on their level. Instead of, you know, you teach those third grade standards and not everyone's there. But during this moment in the day, every student I believe feels successful. Hello, I'm Laura Othout. I teach first grade at Kennedy at Eagles. And I will give you a moment just to read through this little clip that we found. <laughs> well, after explaining my story to Jennifer, she found this, and I'm like, that matches perfectly. As a child growing up, I had a dad, lawyer, um, on the school, as president of the school board, most importantly, a natural mathematician. I, on the other hand, was my mother. <laughs> I could breeze through those math facts and those time tests at, at any pace that I could. I got to third grade, and to this day, I remember the fights and the arguments with my dad over those word problems, because it was like I was speaking another language. <laughs> and I said, Dad, that's not how I learned it at school. And it just came naturally to him. And now, being trained in AVMR, I'm convinced that if I had had this opportunity as a child, I wouldn't have had those struggles. I would have realized how those all, how that puzzle really fit together. So now, coming from that perspective into the teacher perspective, um, it has, AVMR has changed how I look at kids, how I teach it with kids, but most importantly, how I speak about the kids in PLCs with my co-team, with my strategist, and different people, different resources within that school. It went from what can't they do? They're not getting this, they're not understanding this, to here, this is where they are. This is what they're successful with. They're successful with counting on. They're starting at one to count. And we can get that plan to have them moving on to that next, next level. We're looking at actual data, not just kind of how we perceive what they're doing. We have that concrete evaluation to move them on to that, those next steps. And it's that student work that we're really analyzing, that day-to-day -day things of what they're doing. And then next it goes to how did you do that? And it's changed those kids based on, if, even if they're doing simple things at a level one to the higher gifted kids, we're, I'm always asking how did you do that? It's changed how I talk about the students. So it challenges, as Sarah said, it challenges them whether they understand those simple or lower level problems, even to those gifted kids. And it really challenges those gifted kids to explain their thinking, because that's always something that they sometimes work on, too. And then to put all those pieces together, it really has helped with how I speak to parents. Our conferences go from, here's the standards, here's the standards that they're, that they're getting. It changed it. It changed it to a more a positive, and it took that a lot of that emotion out, such as the emotion that I had maybe come into with, and I could see how some of the parents coming into those situations like that. But it takes, it takes out that emotion, and we can create that unified plan to get those students right to where they need to be. So I've seen a lot of, a lot of the, and I'm just beginning my journey with AVMR, and I can already see the positive influences within myself, my teaching, and within the students. So. We're going to let the students and teachers give you a brief picture of what it looks like in the classroom. You will notice that there is a lot of activity in the classrooms and that is the nature of the learning. So very active learning. There were eight under here. I added some more and now there's 11 all together. So you have four and... This should be another five. 
four and three. Yep, four and three together would make that. Four. Would it go? All right, you ready? If I get these two, but I wouldn't go in between these two. Okay, let me see your hand. Okay, Osler, how many blue? Anyway, they're just going to be trapped because yeah. you can't go next to them. How many were all together? If I got these two, then it would be like that. How many more, Osler, do we need to get to Your number is seven. Only using the blue beads. What's the combination that you could push on the top and the bottom? And it's just one swipe. Explain to us what you have, buddy. Okay. Turn it. Very nice. Did you guys hear his explanation? So what did you end up doing? How many on top? And how many on the bottom? Four. This comes before 13. it. Hmm? 13. Oh my goodness. Here is 17. What comes before it? 18. 18 comes after. What comes before? 16. I know that there was a little bit more, but I'm watching the clock, and I know you have quite an agenda. Um, just to wrap it up, Jennifer talked about data-driven. The data that you see in front of you is um, data from kindergarten, from the fall and winter, in both um, forward number word sequences, which is counting forward, the middle one is backward counting, and the one on the far right is numeral um, identification, and you can see that that data is moving in a positive direction. There's, we'd like to leave you with one final thought um, through the eyes of the most struggling student in first grade. That was how he was identified in math. Um, and he did not see his, himself as a mathematician. So this is another type of data. This is after 20, about 20 lessons in math recovery. Um, Am I leaving? Not quite yet. Yes! I love math. Oh. And I yeah. said I do good at it. Yeah, Show them! All Keep right. getting it right. We have nine red. And I put some blue under, and now all together there are 12. How many did I put under here? So all together, 12. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. 12, 3. <gasps> Jeff. I'm doing good today. I'm on fire. You are?
Oops. So uh, it is fun um, to see how much the students are liking it, how much the teachers appreciate the professional development. So what we want to leave you with is that really we are not teaching any new math in school. What we are teaching is being, what we are trying to do is be very explicit about the mathematical thinking that some of you who maybe just caught on to math very quickly and were those natural mathematicians, we're trying to teach that very explicitly so that truly uh, math really does make sense to student, students and that every child can be a mathematician. Some of those techniques remind me of um, Montessori techniques. I don't know if there's some overlap there, but that was really striking to watch that. It was great. Okay. Any other questions? We appreciate your enthusiasm. It was great. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> My fire. <laughs> All right. Other staff reports. Should we start with Anne Marie? None tonight. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. And we've got Brock done. Rachel? Mine is very brief, and Jennifer actually could have done this one. Um, just an update with Ed Clapp that they are hosting their open house next Monday night at the Carlson Library in the community room. Um, which actually faces our library. And the intention of that is to continue to take on kindergarten registrations as well as other new students, um, have decisions about before and after school care, busing, other questions and concerns. So from 5 to 7 on Monday night at the library. Okay. And Bob? Nothing at this time. Okay, thanks. Dr. Schatz? I really don't have much. Um, just maybe a comment on Ed Clapp and that uh, you got to see Jennifer tonight and She's been the one busy behind the scenes putting that all together and she's just done a terrific job. And I went out today to meet with her to talk about some of the things she was questioning as to what are my next steps to get this up and going. And um, so we had a really nice talk about that, but I'm just really pleased with the work that Jennifer's done and she was the right person for that, for that job. So things are really progressing well. And um, having that first meeting next week will really start to bring the pieces together uh, for that community of students and parents that will be um, at that school, so kudos to Jen. Okay. A couple other us toured too, and I heard Rebecca tour today. Good, we can't wait to hear about it. All right, we have a consent agenda in front of us. I would entertain a motion. Jim. I move adoption of the consent agenda with the HR addendum as provided in the packet. I second that motion. Okay. Motions on the floor, any questions? All those in favor of approving the consent agenda with the HR addendum as presented, please vote by saying yes. 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 Any opposed, no. All right, next on to the business section. We have our health insurance committee recommendation and Jennifer, our health insurance committee liaison, will present for us. Well, actually, we have many guests in the audience here tonight. Um, from the Health Insurance Committee, and John Nelson has agreed to, to share with you all the proposal, which was the request of planning, that's why. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and we do have a large contingent from our committee here uh, with us tonight, so thanks for attending. Bail me out if I make a misstep here. Um, First of all, it's uh, each year uh, the duty of our health insurance committee to uh, come to the board with a recommendation. Um, and in the past, um, this committee has basically looked at two things. Do we change the plan uh, or do we change the percentage funding uh, between bo uh, employer and employee? Um, for many years, we have been studying uh, consumer-driven uh, health care uh, plans, and we feel we're finally at the right point in our understanding of a consumer-driven plan, a high-deductible health savings account plan, uh, to present that uh, to you at, the, at this time. So uh, as, the, as the proposal uh, shows you, uh, we have suggested that we go to a dual plan 
where the employee would be able to choose from a, the current plan with a little different funding uh, level. Um, or they could go to the uh, high deductible plan with a health savings account. Um, it's uh, like I said, we've been studying this for many, many years. We think this is more of a long range plan uh, and will be beneficial in the wellness of our employees uh, and to focus on um, the, the dollars that we put forth uh, for health insurance for not only next year, but for many, many years into the future. Um, we'd be open to uh, questions uh, that any of you may have. Looks like Brock. Um, <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, a couple of add-ons, and certainly I want to thank John and, and the committee. John is the chair of the Health Insurance Committee, and the entire committee has worked hard or over not only this past year to get this recommendation ready, but really over the last two or more years. And, and we've talked to you about <clears throat> potential changes in the plan. I think what's important in the memo that you have in front of you, <clears throat> there's a lot of detail in there. And I think you need to really, um, if you have questions specifically about the model and how it would work, I would encourage you to ask John uh, or um, members of the Health Insurance Committee um, and really things for you to keep in mind, uh, we've been advised by our uh, benefits consultant that typically you see about a 10% or a little greater migration. And when we talk about migration, we're talking about people who will leave the existing plan and move to the new uh, uh, consumer-driven plan. For the modeling purposes, we've assumed a 20% migration. We think that's higher than what we're being told. Um, is the average, but we also want to make sure the board's aware that, you know, the potential does exist, theoretically, that 100% of your employees could move to the new plan. Now, that's highly unlikely, and you understand that if more move, there's a higher cost, and we would have to take a look at that, but um, just make sure that you understand the assumptions that we've built this on, and really tried to focus in on your direction to us, which is don't have the increased cost to the employer be greater than the potential increase in the budget. And you see that that increase uh, under this assumption is 4.3%. Uh, the committee feels very good about that. Um, I feel good about being able to work that into our budget as, as we move forward. Um, but again, I would just wanna point out that there's a lot of detail in there and you may have questions about the intricacies of that plan. Um, and so it, it's before you tonight to either uh, as information or possibly uh, take action if you're ready to do so or uh, however you choose to proceed. Okay, Jim. I am going to make a motion, but before I do that, I've got a couple of clarification points, uh, at least from my perspective on my motion. Um, number one on migration, it's really a one-way street as soon as somebody's elected to go to the high deductible plan, they can't come back a year later and say, I think I'd rather go to the low deductible plan. Otherwise, the HSA account becomes a really interesting, difficult thing for us to deal with. So I think that would have to be one of the components in the plan long go ongoing. I also think that from my understanding and the committee's recommendation, um, the funding level, which is on the bottom of the first page of the HSA accounts, the employer contribution to it, would be the contributions we'd be committing to for plan year 2016. Um, whether that will be an ongoing thing for new hires, for future people that migrate, or perhaps a refunneling to people that might drain down will ultimately have to be a future decision, I believe. Uh, based upon us really getting our hands around how this plan's working. I, I want to tip my hat to the committee. Uh, I served on this committee uh, quite a few years ago. We talked about this idea then. Uh, I suspect when I say quite a few years ago, it was my first tour of duty there, so it was 10 years ago that we started talking about this idea. Um, I think it's long overdue, and I'd like to put forward a motion that we accept the recommendation of the Health Insurance Committee 
uh, for implementation of a dual choice plan for January 1st of 2016. And I think it's critical we act on this soon so the education process can begin with our employees. Second. Okay. Motions on the floor. Questions? Paul. Jim, you mentioned the uh, concept of um, migration only works in one direction. Is that written specifically into the rules of this particular adventure? Uh, it, it was the intent of my motion, for sure. Okay. Um, the reason I say that is that um, I've seen a lot of plans out there, as I know you have as well, and I'm wondering if that's, um, I mean, I've never seen it where you, where once you make a decision one year, you're there for the rest of your term at that school. Um, is the purpose behind uh, keeping migration in one direction simply because it would be very difficult to keep track of a health savings account or? Well, first of all, I think it's a requirement to have the health savings account to have the high deductible. So it becomes very, very interesting in the tax code if you no longer are on a high deductible plan, what then happens to your HSA account because it technically is the employee's money the day it goes in. Uh, the other reason I think that's very imperative is we don't want to end up with what would be considered an anti-selection pool in the low deductible plan where people go, well, you know, we're not going to have a baby this year, so let's have the high deductible. We're going to have that baby next year. We'll get to the low deductible. You'll be really, really putting pressure on the low deductible plan uh, by loading it in years when people could anticipate types of claims like a pregnancy. So I actually think in the workplace today, there are very few places where you could move off your high deductible back into a lower deductible if it's a dual choice situation. At least I'm not aware of a company that would allow that. And particularly that's important because of the self-funded nature of this, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Because I know that exact situation happened with me. I had a high deductible and then I had the choice next year, this was a few years ago, that I could move off that if I wanted to. And in fact, I have an HSA sitting there. It's treated tax-wise exactly like an IRA account. Um, so it, it isn't impossible to treat it tax-wise, but I think your uh, anti-selection comment is, is the real killer on a uh, self-funded program. It would be very easy to say this year we're going to have some big expenses, so let's go to that, that program. But I'm, I'm just not sure that um, I've seen it very often where you're prohibited from, from moving. So that's why my question came about. Jennifer. I don't remember talking about that in the health insurance, but my tenure has been short. Maybe could you enlighten us, maybe, John? Have you all talked about that? If, was that the primary, or was that one well, of the it, criteria? Well, it has been talked about, uh, and it, as it has been explained to us by um, Gallagher, is that it is possible to switch back and forth. Um, actually, from our studying of it, is the um, the people that have high expenses are actually uh, the people that could actually gain the most from a high deductible plan because their max out of pocket is actually uh, minimized in comparison to the to the standard plan uh, that we that we currently have. Um, so you know it's it's such an it's individual on which plan would actually uh, benefit uh, an employee. But as we, as we look at this, we've had discussions about what's our long term in three years or four years or five years, do we want to have everybody on a single plan? Do we wanna say that in five years, everybody will be on a high deductible health savings plan? And what the committee has said is that we would like to be able to gain information and gain knowledge uh, about this plan and about the changes in health care and about health care insurance uh, that will take, take place over the next few years. Um, and, and we think that's our job as a committee, is to each year bring to you a recommendation on this is what we feel is best for the district and best for our employees. Uh, and we uh, 
our discussions focused around, we've talked about this a, a long time. We think this is a good plan. We think it will be great for our employees. Let's make this move, then let's continue to gather information and make the best decision we can year after year after year on what's best for the district and what's best for our employees. Paul. And I'm not sure who will have the answer for this, but uh, do we uh, hire a firm then to run the HSAs and do we have a rough idea of what we uh, pay to have a firm administer those HSAs? Um, I'm trying to remember if that was uh, listed in here, but we did get that information uh, recently and the projection was, help me out here, Brock, was it three? $3,000 per 10% of migration. Um, it's, a, I believe it was a dollar seventy-five per employee per month. Uh, and typically that has been picked up at, at other school districts and other companies as part of the general fund, just like we do now on our 403s and things like that. Brock. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, and the first part of your question, Paul, is yes, we would need to select somebody to administer that for us, typically a financial institution. Um, every employee who goes to this plan doesn't get to just have their own bank set that up. We would establish an institution where would, they would set up those accounts for the employees. And we would, that would be the next step as we move forward. And what I'm hearing is that that's about $1.75 per employee per month for that cost. That's pretty reasonable. I would like to say thank you because I also served on the health insurance committee, as did John, as did Jim, and Jennifer. So thank you for your work. And uh, I'd like to say they've all served with me because I've been on yes. the committee since 1991. You know, if you hang out long <laughs> enough, you might get like an administrator of the year award or something, John. <laughs> I, think, I think that's just for hanging out long enough, yeah. So. I have a question about, I got some chuckles in the back there. Cody's laughing. Um, I have some questions about representation. So how are the people that are, for, for the audience's sake, how are the people chosen that are on the committee, and was this recommendation uh, consensus or unanimous? Uh, we have a uh, consensus um, plan on a, on a committee. Um, and it was by consensus, but I think it was unanimous consensus at our last meeting that we present this. Um, the uh, committee has undergone a, a couple times since 91. We have restructured uh, and um, gone to the different groups that are involved in that uh, and to figure out the representation. Uh, I could go back to our, Cheryl probably has it off top of her head, but we have currently, we have six, six teachers. We have um, three support staff, I believe, two administrators, um, three maintenance, and then we have some, we have a school, uh, other people that are there for basically uh, administrative help, uh, moral support, uh, kick in the pants, uh, that type of thing. Okay. So good cross section. Yes. Okay. Good. And and congratulations, by the way, <laughs> Paul. Yeah, I too would like to add my thanks, uh, having been around the board for a long time. Uh, this has been a an ongoing question and concern that we've dealt with for a long time. And I noted with particular interest today when I looked at the the memo. Um, from the Health Insurance Committee recommendation that we're presenting a, um, a dual option health plan spelled with an E. So um, good luck with that. Hope that all works out. <laughs> John. M Madam President, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I, I do want to join in in thanking the committee members for their hard work. After sitting on the committee for a couple of years, you almost make it look like this was easy to come by, and, and it wasn't. I, it, I, we need to commend you for for really uh, being innovative, actually, in in an approach that shows flexibility going forward and, and is respectful not only of of the district's uh, leadership and in, in administratively, but but the staff and and the people that we're serving and and it's a quality of life issue. 
The only question I have at this point, because some of, most of them have been answered, and I, I don't want to assume this, I think, but new employees, choice still, or how does that work? You know, we had some discussion, honestly, about would we tell a new employee that this is the only plan available, but uh, we felt uh, that they should have the same choice as every other employee uh, in the district, and they would have a dual plan uh, option as well. Any other questions? Okay, we do have a motion on the floor. Madam President, can I have, ask a point of clarification? Sure. The motion itself did not include anything about the migration and not ma migrating back. Um, is that accurate for the record? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. All right, Anne-Marie. Benson. Okay, I'm sorry, Anne Marie. Let me just clarify. It did not include that, or it did? It did not. So the motion is can you read us the motion? The motion is to accept the recommendation of the Health Insurance Committee for implementation of a dual choice plan effective January 1st, 2016. Okay, yes. Boyd? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Myers? Yes. Strand? Yes. Nelson. Yes, motion carries. We are at an hour, so we will take a five minute break. Thank you. We are back in session. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you wanna introduce the FM flood risk management district number one special assessment information. Uh, absolutely, first of all, this is under business, but we're not intending to take action tonight. It'll be on our April 28th agenda for our final action. Um, the district is a property owner in the city of Fargo, and as all of you that are property owners are probably aware of, we have this kind of unique election going on right now to authorize a special assessment levy authority to the Cass County Joint Water Resource District. Um, so the district received its ballots uh, based upon all of our properties, where they're located, they get weighted differently. But in essence, the total assessment theoretically that could come to the district uh, once this special assessment has been authorized, and it appears it already has been uh, based upon the actions of Cass County and the city of Fargo. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we someday could see a bill come to our doorstep of $6,249,458. It is not anticipated that that will be coming in any early framework whatsoever as they have a sales tax that they intend to try and pay off the bonds with. This is a backstop uh, to that sales tax which should allow the uh, district to get a low, in this case, the water resource district, to get a lower interest rate on the indebtedness they're gonna take on for this project, uh, which is the flood diversion project and all the components of it. Uh, in layman's terms, this would then become a double barrel bond. It would be backed by the sales tax and it would be backed by the ability of this governing body to levy a special assessment. Uh, Brock and his team at the request of planning broke this down so we could see the impact to our property owners. And again, I don't wanna give anybody the impression that we anticipate we'll see the entire amount of this special assessment ever come to the district for payment, but it could, theoretically. Um, and if we were to take on the entire amount and chose to pay it off in five years, you'll see that that would in effect create a need for us to levy 4.43 mills based upon our property valuation from the last uh, actual valuation we received from the county and the city. Uh, if we did it over 10 years, we'd be adding 2.3 mills to our property tax payers. If we did it over 15 years, it would be 1.66 mills. So even though it's a big number, when you start spreading it out over time um, and you look at the valuation that we assess our mills to, it becomes much more palatable perhaps. Uh, in dollars and cents, we also wanted you to have a sense of it. 
if a taxpayer, a property owner that lives in the city of Fargo in the Fargo School District lived in a $100,000 home and we chose to pay the special assessment if we got the full bill over a 15 year period, their annual property tax bill based upon today's valuation would go up $7.48. If we chose to do that same amount of money over five years on the $100,000 home, it would go up $19.94 per year. And you see the corresponding numbers if somebody had a $250,000 home, what their extra load for this special assessment would uh, become. We have the ability to levy a special assessment tax. Uh, that is still a, a, one of the authorities we have by board action. Uh, we currently have not been using our special assessment levy because we paid them all off. We probably, in next year's budget, will actually see a special assessment levy potentially for the specials we anticipate seeing uh, with the opening of Ed Clapp and the infrastructure that had to be put in place there. It has nothing to do with this potential thing. So we wanted to bring this to the board and really let the public understand that the board will be taking action on this at our next board meeting. Um, so if there are members of the public that really want to bend our ear uh, uh, from their perspective, they'll certainly have the opportunity to do it and we'll have it as an action item at our next board meeting. With that, I'm sure Brock or I would be happy to take any questions if there are any. That was a very thorough explanation, thank you. Looks like there are no questions, so this will come back to us at our next board meeting. Thank you, Jim. And you're on again, Jim, for the superintendent contract approval. Thank you, Robin. Uh, first of all, I, I want to thank Rebecca and Dinah, who served on this committee with me. Uh, we met, kind of kicked around some issues regarding what's in Jeff's current contract, what's out there in the marketplace today, and came to you this evening with a recommendation. Long story short, uh, the only component of Jeff's current contract that we're going to recommend a change on is actually on his base pay component. Uh, the other items that are components of his contract, which would be his expense allowance, the incentive pay component, uh, things like PTO, uh, would remain the same in the proposed contract as he has in his current situation. So we're really looking at just changing his base pay number. And our recommendation is that we would increase that to $195,000, as you see in the uh, mock-up of what his contract would be. Uh, the only other changes in that document from the existing contract are just dates. Uh, we historically have had a two-year contract. We review it each year for compensation purposes. And then when we extend a new offer of compensation, we extend the period out for another two-year time period. So absent date changes, the only other change from his current contract is on that base number. And just to put it into perspective, um, without getting into a lot of details, uh, if we were to approve this contract this evening, it would make Jeff currently the fourth highest paid superintendent in North Dakota. Uh, now that's assuming that we compare to what people were being paid this current year with his new salary range. So it could be, quite frankly, when everybody else is done with the same process, uh, he may not be in fourth place in the state. Currently, Bismarck, Grand Forks, and Minot have base salary numbers greater than what we're proposing for Jeff. Uh, but when we add in his incentive pay, we think he's pretty much in line with those large districts as well. Uh, so that is our recommendation. Any questions for the committee? Okay. I'll make a motion that we adopt the 2015-2017 contract for Dr. Jeffrey Schatz, uh, have it prepared by the board secretary, Mrs. Campbell, and signed by our president and Dr. Schatz uh, to go forward effective July 1st. Second. Seeing no other hands, are you ready, Anne-Marie? Boyd? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Myers? Yes. 
Strand? Yes. Benson? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations, Jeff. And John, you're on, or I'm sorry, Jim, you're on again for the sale of the refunding bands, and it looks like Marvin's here too, so. Yeah, yeah we certainly have our bond counsel here, Myron Knudsen, if somebody has detailed questions. Um, we are pretty pleased. Uh, the bid opening occurred earlier today. Uh, as you might all recall, we had action on this to authorize this to go out to bid. Uh, I think two meetings ago, if I'm not mistaken. And we got back some tremendous results today. Uh, we are issuing out approximately $9.5 million in refunding bonds. These will offset some of the indebtedness that we took on for building Davies High School. Um, this is a kind of a two-step process, as you might recall. Uh, we'll probably be seeing further action on some more refunding issues as we get into the next calendar year now. But this particular one uh, came back with an effective total interest rate cost of approximately 1.91% to the district, which will save us over the life cycle of this portion of the bond $2,111,596. Uh, $2 so some pretty significant savings, even, quite frankly, a little more than had been forecast because we got a very, very competitive bid. Uh, from the low bid. So um, I, I, at this point in time, we'll open it up for any questions people have of either Brock or Myron or myself. Jim, all that extra money then will be a savings in the building fund. That is correct. Okay. Um, these bonds are attached to the building fund okay. currently. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Jim. Uh, then I'd make a motion that we accept the bid that came forward from Robert W. Baird and Company and award them the sale of these bonds. Is there a second? Second. John, thank you. Any other questions? All right, Anne Marie. Johnson. Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Myers? Yes. Strand? Yes. Benson? Yes. Boyd? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Motion carries. Rebecca, your button when you're pushing it doesn't turn on. Yep, no, it's, yep, that's working. Yeah. All right, next agenda item is the 2016-17 calendar approval, and Rebecca served on that committee. Would you like to kick us off? There we go. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, I was happy to serve on the committee, and uh, as referenced before, we had a survey that went out to folks within the district and it looks like there were about 2,500 participants that uh, answered the survey questions which was very helpful to us uh, for our 2016-17 uh, calendar discussion and I want to thank everyone that participated in that and we actually uh, were able to utilize that information uh, to finalize the calendar that you see in front of you tonight. So we use that as well as, of course, the state statutes to make our decisions. And I wanted to let everyone know that the five parameters in the survey were um, start date, end date, spring break, parent-teacher conferences, and other days off, such as the day prior to Thanksgiving. So I'll go through this um, just to show that we, again, took the information into consideration from approximately those 2,500 participants. The start date, uh, a majority of uh, those that participated suggested the start date be in August. And the calendar in front of you has our first contact day as August 25th. Uh, the second parameter, the end date, a majority suggested to end the last week of May. Um, we came almost as close as we could to that. The last contact day on this calendar is Friday, June 1st. For spring break, uh, that was kind of a, uh, it wasn't, 
a, a huge difference in regard to um, do folks want an entire, say like an entire week or do they want an extended time off or an extended weekend, but definitely people did want to have some kind of extended time off. So for the 2016-17 calendar, it's a little bit different than the 15-16 calendar. Um, we have five days off in March. For parent-teacher conferences, that was um, something that was discussed too in the survey, and it was basically just that it indicated that um, participants want to have both evening and day conferences uh, for parent-teacher conferences. It doesn't so much obviously affect the start and end date of the school year. The, all the schools based on middle, elementary, and high school will adjust their parent-teacher conferences accordingly. And in terms of other days off, such as Thanksgiving, the calendar has a, a day off, uh, as an example, prior to Thanksgiving and the day after. So I um, wanted to make sure that everyone uh, knew those parameters that we took into consideration. Again, in addition to state statute. Uh, Dr. Gross, do you have anything to add? Um, the only other thing is, as we built the calendar, um, we did that over the course of two different meetings. That's a little bit faster than we have done in the past because this committee was already t together that built the 15-16 calendar. So many of the items that we do as a committee, just talking about statute and the things that need to be in the calendar were already taken care of. Um, the group did go back and get some feedback from those that they work with, their peer group, um, to build this. And then lastly, this calendar was presented to the city PTA for their review. I did contact the president by email and ask if there were questions or concerns, and she responded that uh, they did discuss pieces of the calendar, but there was nothing that would cause us to bring it back for reconsideration. Paul? Uh, Rebecca, I'm just trying to look at the calendar and maybe decode the color combinations there. Did you say there were five days off in the month of March? Yes, there are five non-contact days in the month of March, the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. Okay. The gray days. Okay, well, that I don't know that that shows up all that well on anybody else's, does it? But, uh, so 13 through 17 are non-contact days. Are they uh, teacher staff days? They are not. They would be non-contact, non-contract days. So uh, a typical teacher would actually could theoretically have off the 11th and 12th Saturday and Sunday plus the 18th and 19th Saturday and Sunday and the entire five-day week in there. We've now developed a, uh, a nine-day spring break there. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so do we need a motion for this guy? Go ahead. I move the 2016-17 school year calendar be approved as detailed in the Board of Education memo number 108 dated April 14th, 2015. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion and second. John. Uh, Madam President, uh, Rebecca and Dr. Gross, I'm just, so we, when is graduation day, first of all? We've removed that. <laughs> <laughs> Must be June 2. As we look at this calendar, the last student contact day would be uh, June 1st. So we would have graduation that following weekend. Um, so the weekend would be the June 4th for that graduation. Okay. Just, just so I understand it, the sentiment of going that far into June as opposed to, I suppose, uh, the trade-off would be the, the week off in March. Could you help us, uh, help me understand the, the dynamic of the discussion that led to that week as a preference versus getting done a week earlier? I can talk about that a little bit. The 15-16 calendar doesn't have as many days off, kind of like a traditional spring break as this one did. And the survey information came back almost not quite split, but really pretty close. So uh, part of the discussion at the committee was also to, uh, n not 100% that we're gonna do this kind of an every other year deal, but um, for the 2015-16 school year, not as much time off in March, and we end a little earlier uh, for the 16-17 school year to have 
uh, give folks a, a little bit more time as requested, but just go a tad later. If I might, Madam President, then help me understand how these, this calendar with that week off in March compares or, or not uh, other calendars in the community. We are uh, in front of many other districts in building a calendar this far out. We did review, though, the calendars of NDSU um, and Concordia, which had calendars in a similar time frame. Um, Minnesota State Moorhead did not at the time, at least we could not find it online. Our calendar would allow our staff who are continuing their education in the summer to take advantage of those summer school opportunities. It does not align the spring break with those other institutions because again, um, there's not consistency among those institutions and there were no other K-12 um, school systems that had a calendar out this far. Does that answer your question, Sean? Madam President, then as long as I'm the only one asking anything um, at the moment, the, the, the survey you have with the respondents, is there any uh, sense of intensity of their opinions with the folks that are one way or the other? I mean, like, if they're kind of equal, will it be uh, assumed that we went on the right side of this and we won't have a real vocal um, backlash? Or, or I'm just curious the intensity, how strongly they feel about that schedule break or not. As I review the survey data, 56% of those who responded indicated that they would like a spring break. Um, so it was uh, larger than half of our population who responded. And then we asked a second follow-up question. If they said yes, they would like a spring break, we asked um, what should that look like? <coughs> should it be a few days or a week long? And that's where it was almost 50-50. There was not an overwhelming uh, view one way or the other. And that's why the committee discussed um, this year or on this calendar, trying to build an extended week-long break. But then when we come back together the next time to go a shorter break and kind of alternate that so that that accommodates families um, in our system. Rebecca? Dr. Gross, we talked also, I believe, about uh, putting another survey out fairly soon after this calendar uh, is in effect so that we can get more, you know, more feedback, right? Yes, um, the committee asked that um, before we bring the committee back together next year to build the calendar for 17-18, that we distribute a similar survey, get the results so they can have that at their very first meeting. I don't think we've ever had 2,500 people fill out a survey. That's amazing. It's amazing. It goes to show you how personal everybody takes their calendar. Any other questions? We do have a motion on the floor. Seeing no other hands, we're ready for a roll call. Knudsen. Yes. Myers. Yes. Strand. Yes. Benson. Yes. Boyd. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Nelson. Yes, motion carries. Next item is discussion on administrative policy 3260, naming of facilities. Uh, a board member asked to bring this to the governance committee uh, since we are adding on to uh, the Eagles. And really the debate there was, does this policy apply to renaming the building since there, it comes down to this, are we adding on to an existing facility or are we building a new one? And so with the, the memo that you read prior to the meeting, I think that's really the, the question that we need to have answered at the board level. So John had kind of introduced it, so maybe you want to give us a bit of a explanation, John. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'm, I'm a little more, I interpret it a little differently. That's where I'm hanging my hat. In, in whether it's not so much uh, if we're affecting an existing physical plant or not, it's whether or not we are creating a new school. And, and, and in my interpretation, 
this is a new school. It's even though we're getting there a little differently, uh, we're we're modifying a, a physical plant we already have in our in our in our reach. And we're uh, at, but what we're coming out of it with is a school that never existed before, and it's a K through five school that has never been there before. It's it's a configuration and staff that have not existed before. So that it, that's where I'm at in the way I interpret this. It's a new school even though it's an addition to a building we already have in, in the district. And, and you know, that said, you know, I, I think it's interesting for kids to wonder, well, who, who is Claire Barton? Or who, who was Horace Mann? Or who, who is Carl Ben Eilson? Or, or who, 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 why did we pick some pres presidents? Uh, and not, you know, and why is it, why are some schools named after uh, s some presidents and 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 or not not others? You know, it, it's who's Bennett, who's Longfellow. The, these are the, these are the things that go through my mind. I, I I think that who's Ron Davies, and and why. And then, you know, so that. Aside from whether we get into the nuance of is adding a building or an addition onto uh, a structure in the district's uh, footprint, you know, is that what will where we'll land? You know, or when we're really putting a school where there never there hasn't been a K through five school before, and then the opportunities that come with this, the the the, the educational moment. That, that can surface for, for, for the sake of history and for st countless students who will go through there. Imagine if we had a school named Roger Maris or, or, or uh, Lawrence Welk or, or Warren Christopher or Agnes Geelan or, you know, I've got a list of names here that all in my mind, a list, and I've just got a partial list and our process would create a uh, uh, we'd have a mechanism where we'd get all kinds of names submitted and, and we'd bet that appropriately, but they're all learning experience moments that reflect to a degree maybe people or moments in our history that, that, that can be embedded into and in going forward and in going into the future. So that, that's where I'm at is we could call it the Eagle Center and yeah, we already have the David Davies Eagles, you know. Um, I suppose we could call it the Flicker Tails too, <laughs> you know. Uh, but but my 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 point is relative to our policy. Our policy simply says the process for naming a a new school, and that's whether we decide is is a is a K through five school that didn't exist before a new school or not. I think that's really what it boils down to, Madam President. Jim. Well, I, I really don't have a feeling one way or another, but I want to at least weigh in on the definition of a new school. Um, it wasn't that long ago that every elementary in North Fargo was K through six. So when we changed them to K through five, I don't think we defined them as new schools to be renamed. And the Eagles, which I would assume if we use it, will turn into Eagles Elementary instead of Eagles Center, has been a school for a good number of years in this district. It's serving as a school right now. Um, I'm not against the idea potentially of deciding do we want to give it a new name, but I want to caution us that changing the configuration of the students that attend a building shouldn't define it as a new school. If that was the case, Discovery would have had to been renamed when we decided to make it a three, three grade middle school. Agassiz would have been probably renamed about a dozen times since it's been built. South High, North High would have to be renamed. Uh, actually South would have been named one way, changed again and then changed back uh, because we went from th four grades to three to four. So I would argue with you, John, changing from a K through three building, which it is right now, uh, I think, or K through two building, 
uh, to a K through five isn't, in my sense, the definition of a new school. But again, I, I'm okay either way with this one. But I don't want us to think every time we reconfigure grade levels at a building that we theoretically might look at renaming it too. Paul. I think the spirit of what John is talking about is that we have an opportunity here, and regardless of what our past policy has said or may be interpreted to say or changes that could have been brought about, as a school board, we can decide to do whatever we want to with this. And I would suspect, uh, in fact, more than suspect, I think I'm pretty sure of this, that we never really voted as a school board to name that facility that's out there with such an eloquent name, the Eagle Center. It was simply a descriptive term used to describe a building that was once an Eagles uh, place, club. club. Yeah, club. It was a club. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity for us to decide what we want it to be. Maybe we want it to be the Eagles Elementary School. Maybe we want it to be Agnes's School. And uh, I think it's an opportunity, and I think we should go down that line. And John, I, I tend to agree with you. Maybe not the specifics of, oh, we changed the configuration. I would just say, hey, this was a warehouse that we converted into a school for a while, and now we're going to make it an actual school. And so let's give it a name. I will talk about a little bit of history. Um, there was an effort to move Woodrow Wilson, or change the name of Agassiz to Woodrow Wilson. And it caused a tremendous amount of confusion with emergency services across town. And so we basically had to revert to Woodrow Wilson at Agassiz. That's one of my bigger fears from just a very pragmatic standpoint. Um, and I, I like the idea of naming schools in honor of wonderful, accomplished people, but it might also be, um, you know, Daisy Elementary. And, you know, the, really the trend is Horizon. <laughs> Daisy too. <laughs> but do you get my do you get my point? Everything is a learning opportunity, but I just really fear the confusion it would have with law enforcement if we did change the name of the school right now. Linda, um, I wasn't expecting John to sway my feelings about it, but you did. I, I completely did a one eighty uh, as I thought about what you were saying because I was kind of on the same page as as Robin. Um, but I really do think that, you know, when we've responded to the way our population is shifting and, you know, we've really asked a lot of our families uh, in patience and understanding as we've gone through various boundary issues. And I think this is an, oper uh, an opportunity to give that school, it is a fresh start, it's, it, 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 that facility has um, been used for different things as kind of temporary measures over the years. It's been this and then we needed it to be that and then we needed it to be that. Now it's gonna have a fresh start as a stable elementary school. And I think if we make, if we follow the process and have a very public process, I mean, you know, office buildings and businesses change names all the time and the police can still find it. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not too worried about that. Um, and a chance to you, one, one thing I always do notice when you go into, especially the elementary buildings, you know, Lincoln is all about Lincoln, and you learn about that very important historic figure, or Clara Barton, or Carl Benn, or Ron Davies. I, I, I think it's an important learning opportunity for local history as well. So, um, there it is. Rebecca. Well, my, one of my questions was going to be, how was the name of Eagles Elementary originally decided? I remember when it was, um, when when the kindergartner, kindergarten center opened, but I, I didn't pay any attention to why it was named, what it was named. So, and I also uh, didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about if it was a new school or a remodel. I think I fell on the side of remodel uh, but it would obviously have a different configuration. And uh, John, I like, I like your comments. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for us to connect with our community. And the process, I guess a question that I would have, and I don't know if we decide this tonight, but um, AP 3260, if that, um, the policy outlines how, um, community members, we basically anyone would go about submitting names and 
um, the process that the district would go through to solicit that information through media and whatnot, and obvious, and then the board uh, deciding in the end what the name of the school is. So I think um, it's up to it would be up to us as individual board members and our own obviously opinions and thoughts on the matter as to if um, we feel like it should be um, someone based on history or someone from you know a president or if it is a community member or if we're going with something like eagles or vision or or discovery i think that's likely would be up to if we decide to open it up that's up to us to decide as board members once we see the really great ideas that come through so i'm in support of us opening it up and i did not think about at all the naming of Ed Clapp Elementary, uh, figuring it would be named Ed Clapp Elementary because of the park. But I also don't know if that was a, um, a formal board vote or decision in regard to how that school was named. So it would be interesting to be educated on that. But again, um, assuming that was a person that was obviously important in our community, the park was named Ed Clapp Park and the school is named Ed Clapp Elementary. So uh, I just wanted to say that, John, thank you for uh, making the suggestion and bringing this up and I'd be supportive of, of this. Uh, it would also be, I see, it would basically be a rebranding of that building. And I think it would be another way that the district is able to engage and communicate really well with the community. I have no idea that, or I have no um, questions that the district wouldn't be able to um, handle that communication effectively. Thank you. Rebecca, a little history on Ed Clapp. We were pretty much required to call it that um, through the Park District. That was part of the agreement, and that's what we agreed to in writing. One of the conditions, I guess, is the best way to put it. So in the pure sense of the word, we didn't really vote on it, per se. Well, it, it makes sense. Thank you. John. It was a bar. It was a, a, Eagles is a fraternal order that many people are familiar with within our community. So, um, okay, we can beat this to death or we can, we can take action. <laughs> Paul? Well, I was just gonna say that, um, are, are we under any kind of time constraint here, Dr. Schatz, that we need to have this perhaps discussed and decided upon in the real near future, or how are we doing? Well, from, from what I read in the uh, policy, it says that um, when construction has become a financial reality, well, we haven't opened um, bids yet, so I would say that once we open bids and we know that it's a financial reality, then we could certainly move forward with whatever the wishes of the board would be. And we're anticipating that would be in June bids. So sometime after that. Just to follow up to what I was going to say, and I th certainly think there's nothing wrong with making a decision tonight or not making a decision. We've got lots of time. They haven't really started pounding nails yet or whatever they do. Um, I think that maybe what, what might be appropriate is if our administration came back to us with a, a uh, suggested approach for how we should go forward with this, and then we could vote on that at that time, rather than to just jump into it tonight and say, okay, we're gonna do this according to the old, the policy we've had for a long time, let's just do this. You know, let's give the administration a chance to suggest, because we can always change policy. John. Madam, Madam President, in light of that, I appreciate that, I move that these, Fargo Board of Education adhere to and follow the guidelines established in AP 3260 to explore the options for naming the new K through five school configuration that will be opened at the former uh, Eagle Center. Second. Second. Is that safe to assume then that you are implying that this is a new school, not an addition. Because according to the policy, there, there's, there's a couple interpretations, and I think that's the biggest question here. It, it's simply my motion. Paul. Uh, even though I was one of two seconders on this motion, uh, which would make it a fourth type of a thing, 
Um, you know, maybe, John, we would be a lot clearer if we just simply moved that our administration come back to us with a, a suggested approach on this because there still does exist the question, is this an addition, is this a new building, what is it all about? And, you know, we're not in any time crunch and we all would like to make this happen, but let's let our, you know, maybe just let our administration come back to us at the next meeting and say, look, here's, here's our recommended path and, you know, do it in a little, not quite such a quick to deliver. Madam President. Yes. Could I have Mr. Strand re-read his motion, please, for the record? I'll try to remember what I said. That I would move that we adhere to and follow the guidelines established in AP 3260 to explore any and all names and follow the procedures established in the policy for the school at the location, uh, what that was, the, the Eagle Center. Does that help, Anne Marie? Okay. 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 I guess we're ready. And, and Madam President, if Paul, if you wanted to table it or amend the motion to, I'm not. Uh, it, that's, I'm not averse to that at all. Okay. Well, let me respond to that, uh, John, and and maybe this is part of the discussion and probably why I'm going to vote against this because I don't think it advances the question at all. We've had 3260, it's there. And, uh, but there's a question about how to interpret 3260. And so my suggestion was, why don't we let the administration come back to us with um, their, you know, a reasonable interpret, I don't think it's a controversial interpretation here at all, but interpret 3260 as to how it applies and what process we want to go through. And we've got plenty of time to do that. So but I would either, I mean, we could table this or we could vote it down or we can do whatever we want. Madam President, did uh, did Paul get recorded as a second? Yeah, I wrote down Linda, but I'm open <laughs> to changing that. You know, if again, as, as a friendly, I'm, I'm very open to a friendly amendment if that's the case. And if you were the second or, or if the Can second would uh, advance that, I'm very fine with that. What if we were to, hold on just a sec, let's hear from administration for a minute and see if anybody wants to add anything in. No, I, I just want to say that there are no such things as friendly amendments. Let's remember that. So it has to be an amend, amendment to the original motion, but we can't call it a friendly amendment. So that's just protocol. And not only that, if we did what I'm suggesting, it would not be considered an amendment because it totally changes the direction of the vote. Uh, that's also part of the parliamentary procedure. But, you know, we're kind of squibbling over little deals here. I think uh, we either do this now and follow this policy or else we we wait and get some feedback. I'm losing control of this meeting, I think. <laughs> Linda and Rebecca. Oh, it's just discussion. That's fine. Go ahead. Well, do we need to decide that it is a new school? Is that what will lead administration to putting together a plan such as what Paul is suggesting? Or can that recommendation come from, I don't know, another committee, and and then we vote on it from there? I think, I, I, I think that's our job. I don't think it's administration's job. I think administration will do whatever we ask of them and whatever guidance we give. I think it's putting administration in an awkward position. I I want to hear what administration thinks of the idea. If, if naming a new school seems like a good idea or a bad idea or I don't really care, you just tell us which way you want. Um, but I really do think that, that that deciding on that philosophical question is our job. Paul. Since I brought it up, I'm gonna just make a quick comment about that. Uh, no one would probably ever say, oh, Paul, you always agree with everything the administration does. But uh, I think it's appropriate for the administration to look at this and give us some guidance as to what direction to head down. Um, just listening to most of the comment here tonight, it sounds like most people are in favor of, uh, of uh, probably coming up with a name, and I don't mean to speak for anybody else, but all I'm saying is, gee, we don't, uh, voting yes on this particular motion does nothing to advance us because we already have this policy in place. This is like saying, I vote to affirm the policy. Well, we have the policy. 
Well, I have a motion on the floor and we can't move forward until we address this motion. Okay, I see no hands. Anne-Marie? Myers? No. Strand? Yes. Benson? No. Boyd? Yes. Johnson? No. Knudsen? No. Nelson? No. Motion fails. Jim? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to direct administration to digest our conversation of this evening and come back with a recommendation for possible approaches to renaming the facility that we are going to make the addition to. Second. Discussion. Okay, you ready? Type faster. <laughs> Strand? Yes. Benson? Yes. Boyd? Yes. Goldenberg? Excuse me. <laughs> Johnson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Myers? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is policy monitoring, EL 5 and 6. Excuse me. I didn't see any thing besides in compliance. There were a couple of uh, comments, however. Does anybody want to expand upon those? Okay, Jim? No, I just want to make a motion that we accept uh, EL5 and 6 as provided in our packet in memo 111 and memo 112. Is there a second? Okay. Now, would anybody like to expand upon their comments? What is meant by informal evaluation? Did you have that answer, Jennifer? I did. Dr. Schatz called me and um, clarified that a bit. We did have a bit of a discussion about it. And um, I guess my question, just to expand a little bit, had to do with when I read state statute, there was nothing in there that um, referred to informal versus formal. And so I just wanted some clarification around what exactly that means, how we define informal. Any other comments? Okay. Benson? Oh, I'm sorry. Jim? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Boyd? Yes. Goldenberg? Excuse me. Johnson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Myers? Yes. Strand? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Motion carries. Jim, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I'm wondering if we could Mike, maybe, please. Uh, I'm wondering if the board would allow me to move item number nine up in front of board reports. I know we have uh, at least one guest in the audience, and depending upon how long executive session goes, we may decide to forego sharing. So I'd like to suggest that as an agenda change. Any opposition? Okay, that's what we'll do. We will take a break and reconvene in executive session, or to go into executive session at 7.30. Okay. We are back in session. Jim. Yes, I'd like to move that the Fargo School Board go into executive session for, the purp for two purposes, uh, for discussion of negotiation strategies and for attorney consultation on a potential litigation as permitted under North Dakota Century Code 44-04-19.1. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second. Anne-Marie, I assume we set a business item? Okay, roll call. <coughs> Boyd? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Knudsen? Yes. Myers? Yes. Strand? Yes. Benson? Yes. Nelson? Yes. We will go into executive session. If everybody would like to depart the room, that is not included. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, Laura. We are back in session. Okay. Okay, gang. Next, I um, 
I all for moving our NDS or NSBA reports later, unless anybody objects, they will be at the next meeting. Hopefully that'll be a shorter agenda. So that brings us to our committee liaison and correspondence reports. You wanna start with Linda? Briefly, I uh, attended the community Devel development committee meeting at City Hall. Um, I lost the version where I had my notes. And also uh, did the tour of Ed Clapp School today, and um, then we talked the, the fact that negotiations has met and will be meeting on the second. Paul. Next week, you know, I normally remember, so I'm feeling bad I didn't do it, but next week we uh, have the Park and Public Schools Alumni Foundation breakfast with uh, Steve Stark, who's <coughs> going to be, who always does a good job at this, by the way, and I would hope if you haven't already responded to the email that I'm assuming you all got, that you do so, because it's a, it's a fun activity and a great way to connect with other alums and people of interest. People of interest. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Well, uh, it's an interesting thing, Robin, since you bring it up. We, when we talked about this, their first comment was, well, in order to attend, you have to be an alum of the district. And we looked around the foundation table, and half the people were not alums. So <laughs> sorry, you can't attend. But then they modify that, and eventually we got where we are, and it's all good. So awesome. Anyway. Thank you, Paul. Jennifer. OK, um, so let's see. I attended Building Bridges. Um, we talked about the health care committee earlier, Kennedy Carnival and Ed Clapp tour, and I'll save my share outs for building bridges for next week. But one thing I will say is during the Ed Clapp tour, uh, Jim pointed out the nice soccer fields and the improvements to them. And it reminded me of the um, key takeaway, it seemed, from building bridges that everyone wanted us to hear was soccer. Mm -hmm. Soccer is the universal sport how can we make soccer available in our elementary schools? And so maybe these things will come together. Anyway, that's, yeah, right, right. So that's it for tonight. I attended the Building Bridges Conference as well. Um, on Tuesday, I will, on the 21st, I'll have my uh, visit at Kennedy with the strategist. And I toured Ed Clapp School today and it's going to be beautiful. We have great sunlight coming in from, I think, all directions. The classrooms are coming together. And uh, it's interesting. I like the configuration of uh, the, the K and kindergarten and first grade area as a one level area. And then the second and then the two levels uh, for the uh, rest of the grades. I, I, and then the separate entrances for, again, K through K and one, uh, as far as say access and bus pickup and drop off and the playground area. I think it was really wonderful to have that tour and have Jim take us through and give us all the different details. You can tell he's really excited about the building and proud of it. And there are some new, uh, what do I wanna say? I'm, I'm gonna say um, technicalities that are going into the building or features going into the building that we don't have in some of our other schools. So I had mentioned to Jim if we could put together a little, uh, just a, a sheet of information or something to have if it's on our website or um, about some special features of that facility. Uh, and it sounded like he would be interested in putting something like that together, but I think it, it would be interesting for community members to realize uh, some of the features that are going into a building when we put <coughs> something new up. And that is it, thank you. John. The, I agree, the Building Bridges Conference was just uh, really an eye-opening experience for me. I, I visited with people just off the top of my head from Ethiopia, Liberia, Rwanda, Burundi, Sudan, Somalia, Congo, and <coughs> Vietnam. Uh, that was just, uh, that, that's just really quite the exposure we had thanks to the district for, for sponsoring us. Ed Clapp, the good news is it's, it's nice to see something not on paper. 
whether it's a budget or blueprints and to see the real thing but from a budgetary blueprinted sense it's on time and it's on on budget which is really good news to us too Jim uh, planning met I think you saw some of that in tonight's agenda we may be meeting uh, possibly before our next April 28th meeting especially if the legislature gives us a k-12 funding bill uh, currently we don't have a date but if you're on planning you might want to hold April 24th April 27th and April 28th because I'm pretty sure those are the only days between now and then that the planning chair is in Fargo starting in about 14 hours oh not even that I guess it's later than I thought I handed out my president anything else sorry April 24th which would be Friday uh, April 27th which would be Monday April 28th which would be Tuesday of the school board meeting and again Brock and I have not calendar uh, coordinated to know if he's even available on those days but if you're on planning you might want to hold them just in case we end up trying to find a day there that works I'm not going through my whole president report, but you see the graduation assignments. It wasn't easy. Um, I always assign the board member that has a graduating relative like myself to that school. So you can use that trump card next year, Rebecca. Um, board member preference, everybody responded, whether you were an assigned a liaison. If you're still gonna be on the board and the order in which the request was received. So if you have any feedback on that, please get that back to me as soon as we can because I know that they want to start printing their, their programs at the, at the high school level. There are a couple RSVPs due. Please get your travel receipts into Anne Marie. Still working on a summer retreat date. Is that looking hopeful at all? Not everyone has taken the survey quite yet, um, but even those have taken it. We're not landing on a great day yet, so we might have another doodle poll come out. But if you could please take that, that would be wonderful. Okay. Jim and I went to the League of Women Voters. Um, Went to South High, I toured Ed Clapp on Monday, and what, the one thing I really liked about Ed Clapp is that the parking lot is not a mile away from the front door. Yeah. High, five. High five, baby. On that, uh, our next meeting date is April 28th. Any items for debriefing? Oh, thank you. We are adjourned.